Dr. McClendon, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to begin by bridging the three key concepts that we are reflecting on today. History, philosophy, and the 16, excuse me, 19 project. And the way I like to frame it is to say, let's begin with the notion of a materialist historical interpretation, a dialectical philosophical critique and the meaning affixed to the 1619 project. Now, how can we bring these things together? Because I don't see a bifurcation between what we would call the external and internal life. I don't see a bifurcation between what would be the political economic context and the experience lived by African Americans. Rather, I see a question of mutual dependency, wherein we have to understand the context of the content, the social, political, historical context of what it means to live a life as an African American in the United States. And if we don't understand then in a rigorous way, the historical context by way of interpretation, then we fail to really give the necessary and sufficient means for understanding then what philosophical critique brings to bear. So I wanna begin first with this element, which is the most obvious manifestation of the 1619 project, which is the question of historical interpretation. Much of the debate that we have been reviewing centers on the interpretation of the history of what becomes the United States. And in that regard, what we have to take into account, albeit that people like uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, in one sense, offers a support to the 1619 project. But on the other hand, his very historical work the one centered on the counter-revolution of 1776, throws much out of the interpretation which is provided by the 1619 Project. Let me explain. The 1619 Project and uh, the interpretation uh, given by Hannah Jones begins with a reflection on patriotism and an affirmation of how African-Americans are in fact part and parcel of a national legacy known as the United States. Now, of course, this is nothing new. We can go back to Dr. Carter G. Woodson among a number of African-American historians who belong to a school of thought which we could uh, define as contributionism. What Langston Hughes referred to, I too sing America. And if we take that approach of contributionism then in terms of a materialist historical interpretation, then we fail to offer a summary critique of the context. And the judgment that is being made then is reduced to a moral appeal, a moral appeal which is very salient throughout African-American history, 
and probably reaches its apex in 1963 with Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, which by the way, the very trope of the dream is something which Dr. King got from Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream defer. And Dr. King was well aware of that uh, Langston Hughes influence. But when we look at this idea that surrounds the interpretation of history, we can only conclude that we have idealism rather than a materialist critique of the context of Black life. And so we have to look then, what is the context of what then shapes the 1619 Project? Why one, Hannah Jones fails to understand that there was in fact a material process of development which Dr. Ferguson made reference to in which then indentured servitude was what was at stake in 1619. And over the course of the historical development of the United States, there were formed 13 colonies, all of which made a commitment to the institution of slavery. We can't forget that. Now, later, certain colonies, as they became states, were involved in liquidating that institution. And we can go through you know, that history. I'm not going to re repeat it here. You can read any US primer and get that, that information. But what becomes important is that in the formation of what we call the state, there was in fact two moves on the part of the former colonies of Britain to establish a state formation with respect to their self-conception of the political economic order. And this is why a materialist interpretation of history is so important here. So let me go back. Number one, all the colonies agreed on the institution of slavery, but not all the colonies persist in the enslavement of African-Americans. So we find, for example, in Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin was once a slaveholder. He later becomes a part of the Quaker movement and talks against slavery, but he was once a slaveholder. Now, what becomes key here is that that first formation in terms of a state through the Articles of Confederation had a loose network so that each colony could maintain a measure of autonomy with regard to the decisions about how that particular colony would function. But that became problematic. And the question we have to ask from a materialist standpoint, what was the real problem here? Was it a matter of the issues surrounding questions about liberty and justice and equality? And we have to answer quite frankly, no. The conflict centered on a political economic reality that said that each and every one of the former colonies, if they were to act in an autonomous fashion, would lead to the fragmentation of the state. And it became centrally important to centralize the power of the state. Hence the Articles of Confederation gave way to a convention to establish what we know today as the United States Constitution. Now, why is this important in terms of context as we talk about African-American life? This is what we have to keep in mind, that when we think about what happened when these former British colonies are now becoming an independent state in the second try called the Constitutional Convention, what becomes most salient is the fact that when slavery is discussed as a matter of the political state structure, there was never a debate 
over whether or not slavery would be a part of the political economic edifice that was being constructed. There was never a debate. What the debate consisted of, how it would be managed, managing the institution, not whether there would be an institution, everyone agreed it would be slavery in the United States. The question is how would that be managed? Whether there would be an extension of the slave trade, give it another 20 years. Well, what about representation and the notion of the electoral college and how do we look at the House of Representatives? We'll count them as three fifths of a vote. People like to say three fifths of a person, but the fact of the matter is that anyone who's three fifths of a person is not alive. Take off your head and you tell me if you're still a person, right? So we know it was three fifths of a vote. It was a calculated means to compromise between the political economic interests of those who were to directly control and develop the institution of slavery versus those who were not directly, because as I pointed out earlier, those regions of what becomes the United States that no longer would depend upon the institution of slavery as a part of its integral political economy. So Massachusetts, right? No slavery. The Northwest Territory, which comes as a part of expansion, begins what? With no slavery. Now, I'm from, excuse me, Ohio, right next to Kentucky. Kentucky was a slave state. Ohio was a so-called free state. But even today, if you go to Cincinnati, you see the vestiges of the racism that happened between that river, the Ohio River, and the relationship that Ohio and Kentucky has. Southern Ohio is very much a very redneck part of the state of Ohio. Kentucky, which was a border state, did not join the Union. And of all people who came from Kentucky, Abraham Lincoln. And one of the things he did politically to maintain this compromise consensus at the expense of African Americans, who the great majority were held as slaves, is to grant then the right of the people in the state of Kentucky to maintain the institution of slavery. It wasn't about, you know, there's some debate, well, slavery is morally wrong. And we heard earlier about the, the question of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln made it very clear that he was to save the Union at, at whatever cost, whether it be to destroy slavery or to maintain slavery. And this is why he came up with the idea that the border states, those slave states that did not join the Confederacy could maintain slavery because the war wasn't about slavery. And so when Frederick Douglass goes to Lincoln and says, look, man, you may not take slavery as the key issue, but if you think of it in practical terms, the South is winning this war and the only way you're gonna win is by bringing in the option of freeing slaves. And if you do that, you're gonna turn this thing around. And that's what he did. The Emancipation Proclamation says, okay, you generals who I told you before, like Fremont, you can't go that far. You can go ahead and do it. However, the border states will not be a part of this. And that's why we have a 13th Amendment. So when we think about a materialist interpretation of history and we look at the 1619 Project, what's missing from that is the fact that it is an idealist approach to history. So what we get from Hannah Jones is the patriotism of black people, their contributions to making this a great country and the immoral ethical principle of why black people have not been able to share in the wealth that was produced by way of the slave uh, system and the historic contributions of black people. What what she does not understand and what uh, Gerald Horn brings forth is that the 1776 movement was not a revolution, it was a counter-revolution. 
And Horn also brings out that the great majority of African Americans, when saw that they had the opportunity by way of Lord Dunmore to fight on the other side, what did they do? They fought on the other side because Dunmore said, look, if you join us, you're free. Black people's contribution to democracy is distorted when you take a contributionist approach because black people were contributing to freedom and democracy, not in terms of the bourgeois structure and state apparatus, which justified their enslavement, they were fighting for their own freedom. And one thing that Gerald Horn brings to the light is that many of those Europeans who left the Caribbean to come to the United States, he said they were compelled to do so because of the numbers in the Caribbean meant that there were more Africans than white people. And when the slave revolts took place there, they were like hundreds of Nat Turners and Denmark Vesey's. And so they left and many of them came to places like Rhode Island and continued to make money off the slave trade even though they weren't slaveholders. Now, why is that important? Because the talk about contributionism blurs the contradictions of the objective context in which Black people live. And one of the things that happened in the formation of the state apparatus, and this takes us now to what I call philosophical critique, is that ideologically, the idea of a United States of America, which I said earlier, sanctioned the institution of slavery, there was no debate among any of those people, and mo most of the people who were presidents or pro-president uh, or pro-slavery were either holders of slavery or pro-slavery. Even John Adams was a lawyer for slaveholders. And the guy that wrote that uh, so-called uh, national anthem, you know what I'm talking about? What's his name? Who's the guy that wrote um, Francis the song? Francis Scott, Francis Scott Key. Key. He was not only a slaveholder, he was a lawyer like John Adams for slaveholders. And his job was to convict abolitionists for breaking the law because the law of the land said what? Slavery was a part of the political economic structure. Now, what Canon Nicole, what is that? What's it? What is Nicole Hannah Jones fails to see is that the contributionist approach does not look at the real material contradictions. Therefore, she cannot provide the philosophical critique of the very nature of the state itself. Because the very nature of the state itself with respect to African Americans was formulated, and of course we hear this quite clearly with the Dred Scott decision, it was not formulated in the interest of African Americans. It was formulated to affirm slavery. So when Dred Scott had this technical issue, I should be free because I was in free territory. What did the Chief Justice say? Who, by the way, was the brother-in-law and best friend of the guy who wrote the National Anthem. <laughs> he says, a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. So if you talk about black people contributing to a system of oppression, then ideologically that means that's a confused person. And she talks about her father and all that he did, but he was confused about what his objective interests were. Any black person who excuse me, sings the national anthem, is confused. Who stands up for the flag is confused. They don't understand their objective material conditions. That's why those who joined the loyalists in 1776 understood that Dunmore says you become free, your objective interest is what? To become free. Not to go back with George Washington and let him to continue to enslave him, followed by Thomas Jefferson, who they lied about for many years, right? They always wanted to distort his connection with Sally, but then it came out, so now if you go for a tour on the Je Jefferson plantation, they have to read 
articulate the contradiction between a man who said that black people were inherently inferior and then at the same time said all men are created equal. The hypocrisy, as Malcolm used to say, of democracy in the United States is centered around a material fact and a material context of which then we have to offer our interpretation. Let me argue this and I'll close. What we have to understand as a part of the political ideological framework is that they have always falsely argued that the United States was one nation. Now this is important. This whole idea of contributionism then rests on the presumption that this country is one nation of which there are multiple racial groups. So in effect, the model or paradigm here is a multi-racial nation of which certain races are faced with racism, right? And thus given racism, once you eradicate that, then we can all live as one. The falsity of that presumption lies in the fact that this has never been one nation. If you look carefully at how they developed the very first census in the United States in 1790, notice how indigenous people are counted. They're counted as what? As nations. You can't have a treaty with someone if you don't presume they're a nation. So if we just go with the indigenous people as nations, then how do you have one under the rubric of that state? My argument is that African-Americans were in fact a nationally oppressed people from the very beginning. And that that national oppression and the shaping of a national culture is precisely the basis for the interlife that Du Bois tried to depict in the souls of black folk. What he got wrong was contributionism. He wanted to appeal to the dominant group just as Carter G. Woodson got it wrong because he wanted to appeal to this idea, well, if you look at all the things we've done, then how can you not say that I too sing America? but they didn't understand the objective contribution of national oppression. So what we have here with the 1619 project is an objective process that liquidates what I call the national question. There's no discussion about the national question. So even when they talk about reparations, the futility of the reparations argument persists because they never established the question of national oppression. And when you don't establish that, and then you see that as a real solution, it can only be a political tactic to involve people, the masses of African-American people in struggle. If you make a moral appeal to the person who benefits from oppressing you, do you think they're going to accept that moral appeal on moral grounds? No. Rights in themselves have only the legitimacy that power can exercise. This is why the Black Power Movement went beyond what Martin Luther King and others were talking about in terms of civil rights, because it became very clear that the same person who was a segregationist Lyndon Baines Johnson, who signed a voting rights bill, was the same person who crushed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in order to get elected as president of the United States. Some of you know that history, right? You know about Miss Fannie Lou Hamer, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and how they had a legitimate right to be at the National Convention of the Democratic Party and they sold them out. And unfortunately, Dr. King went along with that 
And that was the beginning of generating then the critical consciousness about power because the following year you have what? The black power slogan that emerges because people began to understand no matter how much you talk about rights, if you don't have the power to secure your rights, then your rights are nebulous. So the idea of liquidating the national question then leads to contributionism. 1619 is contributionism. Even if we look at Dr. Du Bois and look at Dr. Du Bois in 1903, Souls of Black Folks, then we look at Dr. Du Bois in the mid 1930, Black Reconstruction, what do we find? A movement leftward, right? He does a critique of capitalism. He employs the dialectical method. But does he stop there? No. We have to look at Dr. Du Bois in the 1950s when he becomes one. One of the biggest enemies of this country, and they take his passport away. And they stripped him of all the things that he had done, along with Paul Robeson. And what happened in the 50s, and this is why we have to look at this 1619 project critically. What happened in the 1950s is that people like Paul Robeson, people like Claudia Jones, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, people like William Alpheus Hunton, and so many others faced repression while the great majority of people who were part of the burgeoning so-called civil rights movement remained silent. And so what did Du Bois have to do? He ultimately went to Ghana. He's not buried in the United States. He's buried in Accra, where Nkrumah says, brother, none of these historically black colleges and universities will hire you. You can't get a job and you're the most significant intellectual of the 20th century among African-Americans and none of them, when they had his 80, what was it, 85th birthday party, when E. Fletcher Frazier was organizing that, all the Negro leaders, all the people who we talk about during Black History Month as contributionists said, no, we don't want nothing to do with Du Bois. We don't want nothing to do with Paul Robeson. We don't want nothing to do with Claudia Jones. We want nothing to do with CLR James. That's a class question. And Hannah Nicole Brown, while she should love her dad, everybody should love their dad, a political assessment is different than a personal assessment. If my dad was backward like that, I'd say, I love you, dad, but you're backward. Fortunately, my dad had a sense of militancy, but I would have been ashamed if he had been a lap dog of imperialism and then cry about he didn't get some kind of you know compensation. Now the boys, by the way, did that at one point in his career. And I want to share that with you, uh, Professor Hatton, <clears throat> because the boys at one time wanted to serve in what was the, the precursor to the CIA. And he was condemned by the black left because he was gonna be paid off. That's when he wrote his famous piece, Close Rank, Close Ranks. That piece was to say, forget our particular interests and serve the imperialist war, World War I. And when he wrote that piece, he was, he was uh, promised a role in the US government as a part of the CIA, what was the precursor to the CIA. When he got exposed and he kind of went out off the scene. William Harrison exposed it. So many on the left, the African Blood Brotherhood exposed him, but he learned. He learned that whole contributionism 1619 project. So at the end, he became what? We should never forget where someone ends. We, we start, he began with Souls of Black Folk, but where did he end? He ended as a member of the Communist Party of the United States and said, the hell with the United States, the hell with US imperialism, because racism is not a thing in itself, it's a product of a system of exploitation that exploits people of African descent, not just in the United States, but in places like Ghana, Kenya, 
And he met all those people in 1945 at the Pan-African Conference in Manchester. By that time in his life, he wasn't talking about the souls of Black folk. He was talking about the interests of Black folk and a militant struggle against capitalism, imperialism, and exploitation. He began to realize that that struggle could only take place once you drop the contributionist ideas and develop the, the revolutionary perspective that imperialism is in the interest of the ruling class and not in the interest of Black people. So in conclusion, what I want to say is that when we think about this 1619 project, I agree, it's not new. It's a part of a long tradition of contributionism. You have to go back and read very carefully what Carter G. Woodson says. He was, and I teach my students and we talk about it in our book, he was like Socrates. He was influenced by the Socratic notion that ignorance is the basis for, for bad moral conduct. And so if you taught people about the contributions, that is white people, about the contributions of black people, that would eradicate racism. He saw racism as the product of ignorance. Now, we know that is an idealist view of history. But that particular view of history has been perpetrated and actually galvanized by what Dr. Ferguson talked about when he said about white liberals. Look who founded, established, and promoted the 1619 Project, New York Times. Look who is profiting from the 1619 Project. When you have people standing, all red, I don't know if you saw those pictures of the people when they were releasing the book and all those people, they were standing in a long line and went around the block. Who do you think profited from that? The New York Times. Not to say that Hannah Nicole Smith didn't make, she got what, 20 million for Howard University? She, she knows what's happening. She's playing the contributionist game because that's what the liberal position is today. And so we who have to think in terms of a materialist historical interpretation, which provides us with a dialectical philosophical critique, can better have a discourse, discussion, and deliberation on the 1619 Project. Thank you. Professor McClendon. Uh, Professor Hatton said that a fire was started early on, and I think you. Been, I think that it's still burning. I, I feel some heat coming off that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know, uh, you know, Dr. Ferguson or Dr. Hatton. Maybe you guys would like to to chime in and respond. There's a couple questions in the Q and A, so let's get to those in just a minute. And let me encourage the audience post to the Q and A, and we can take a look at your questions. Mm -hmm. And one real easy answer here. They, uh, people have asked, is this going to be recorded? It is being recorded. We're going to post this on our Ethics Center website. So um, uh, Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Hatton, would you guys like to, to take it a step further? <laughs> Fan the flames a little more? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, for me, I mean, one of the interesting things about this whole debate is that uh, Black studies has been left out of the whole discussion as if it doesn't exist. But part of that is because Black studies are being subjected to austerity measures and haven't been allowed to grow in the last 50 years since its formation in 68. And that creates the kind of contradiction where um, you don't have on the right today, because of a range of reasons, people like an Alan Bloom or De Sosa uh, that would initiate these kind of culture wars. And I think as, as uh, John McClendon pointed out, you know, part of what the New York Times understands, given their, you know, drop in terms of profits, is that culture wars bring people to buy your magazine. <laughs> and that, that's a central component to why we're discussing this is because um, we all know the expensive cost of academic books that make this knowledge inaccessible to working class people. But when you look at a book like this that was published on the newspaper site for free, 
and then you charge people $38 for it. So we can see the kind of backdoor stuff that's going on. And let's not forget that Hannah Jones got the biggest profits out of it all. Um, she basically has a job for life and she's a millionaire for life. She is literally an ideologue of the ruling class now. And we can't mince words about that. There are black members of the ruling class today. That's very important to understand. And that, whether it's Clarence Page or whether it's um, Eugene Robinson or uh, Eddie Glaude, we don't think of them that way because we have a kind of mystical notion about the ruling class, but they're very much a part of the ruling class today. Uh, so, uh... You, you won't get any disagreement from me if we're going to eviscerate the New York Times or, or I, mean, I mean, we can we can take it to the English language if you want. I mean, and to write anything in English is very much uh, right, uh, 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 you know, to to reify or to strengthen the very language that has put us in the predicament that we find ourselves in. So we so we can we can certainly go there. Uh, and 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 so I'm I, uh, but I, but I, but I do think uh, you know, for, for all, all the problems and, um, that, that we, that, it, I mean, that, that have been pointed out, I, I do, uh, you know, I want, I want to think about, um, you know, what, what the, that there are some possibilities for what the, what the, the, the project can, uh, hold out for and 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 part of uh you know thinking about uh you know even the historians who are giving the the critique and 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 uh, professor horn is talking about the declining enrollment of history courses or uh you know students uh finding uh difficulty in in being able to capture all of the material that they uh, the, you know, to, to be able to mine those archives and, and, and those thick history books and, and, and to be able to capture all of this information. And so does it, does the project uh, offer a way to, to, you know, to, to, to point students back to that material and to those courses and to write, to learn uh, and, and to hear, Right, the lectures of you know Dr. McClendon, Dr. Ferguson, uh, you know of Gerald Horn, and so so if 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 they're saying that this is something that hasn't been uh, discussed, then is it something that turns back? And so I think that 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 is one uh, way that I think about its possibility. And then the other for me is that uh, you know I've been teaching in prisons for you know two decades, and the kind of despair. Uh, you know the uh, you know if I if I'm counting the ways that you can uh, you can kill a black person uh, and if we think about historically the different ways that uh, black people have been killed uh, it is in this space that I'm learning that you that, that, that they are continuing to find new ways to kill black people and so for me part of also the kind of holding out possibility that that even in the evisceration and the kind of uh, right attending to what is problematic is that you know as a you know I teach also med medical school uh, I, I teach doc I teach literature and philosophy courses with doctors and these are doctors who are who are talking about the in inequities in the healthcare system and the racism of the healthcare system and the ways in which black people are being killed in a system that is designed to help them so whether in the carceral space the medical space right education as you've pointed out the, the marketplace of ideas, uh, the, the capitalist sphere, if, if you are encountering what is con continuing to happen to black people and the continued ways that they are discovering for how to kill black people, then the critique of the 1690 project duly noted is there a way in which, as I'm suggesting, that if you think about it 
what it has been able to do to bring and draw more attention to those realities. I, I still think that is something that we can perhaps hold out as a possibility. Right. So, yeah. Let me just quickly respond. And I, how can I say, I have an empathetic response to what you're saying. And I know because the struggle for survival is immensely a critical issue. And one who is incarcerated is a part of that immense problem. I know it, as you talked about the interlife, I know it as an interlife issue, not just as an academic question. I have family members who are incarcerated and who have been incarcerated, not for a couple of weeks or a month or 30 days in jail. I'm talking about 27 years, 30 years, half their lives. So I understand that quite clearly and what that means to someone, even when you're finally released, you cannot come out of that condition whole and be the person that you could be because incarceration has such a debilitating psychological impact. And I know about that at a personal level. At the same time, and I've had in my past experiences the opportunity to do what you're doing, Dr. Hatton, and I want to commend you because so many of our contemporary um, younger scholars like yourself are more concerned with careerism than in serving our community. So I want to commend you for what you're doing. And I have in the past have worked with incarcerated uh, brothers and sisters, in fact. And this is what I would suggest to you in a practical way that I think would be immensely more productive. That's if the institution will allow you to bring that material, is to introduce your students to Malcolm X's autobiography and how he analyzed his conditions within that framework. And also, uh, George Jackson, because what George Jackson has to say and what he was able to accomplish within that institution is that he became a better student and intellectual than most people who get PhDs while he was in the institution. You know, and one of the things that's changed, his book is banned in the prison. His book is banned? Still today. Okay. So you, you can see what we're up against. Yeah. In North Carolina, for sure. I don't know okay. about across the country, but in North Carolina, for sure. Okay. This book is still, Blood in My Eyes is banned. And okay. so are others. Okay. So you, you see what we're up against. See, that's where the fight is. We cannot take a minimalist viewpoint and say, well, 1619 gives us a way there. We have to critically look at it because for a brother who's fighting for his life or a sister who's fighting for his lo their lives, you have to bring them to a new understanding. There's a long history of black activist lawyers who they should be studying and learning about, who then can give them the kind of optimism about a future beyond being incarcerated. And uh, for example, Crockett, do you know Judge Crockett who was a Congressman Crockett from Detroit? He was an activist, and even after he became a judge in Detroit, when the Republic of New Africa was arrested um, while they were having one of their first meetings in Detroit, he pull, pulled together a night court and released all those people the police had taken. Later, he became a congressman in the uh, US Congress. Also, there's another activist who you should have them read about, uh, Dr. Simba. He came to Binghamton and, and took on the case of a young student who was charged with murder. You know the lawyer, uh, the lawyer I'm talking about, Dr. Simba? Oh, he passed away. Yeah, but I'm talking about his book. To read his book. I'm trying to think of his name now. Uh, Kunstler? 
Huh? No, no, this is a black lawyer. Oh, black what lawyer. was his name? Conrad Lynn. Yes, Conrad Lynn. Conrad Lynn. There's Howard Moore, who was the lawyer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Stokely Carmichael for many years. In other words, there is a practical dimension to having a critical outlook. What I want to say is that some people see pra practical practicality only in pragmatic terms. What does that mean? A pragmatist will say, you have to be practical. What they mean by that is you have to accept the status quo and, and take that restriction as a given. So that's when people talk about more revolutionary and progressive viewpoints. They say, oh, that's not practical. That was Booker T. Washington's whole view yeah, the Dr. Ferguson was getting at. He said, it's not practical what Du Bois is talking about over here. So we should go along with segregation. We should understand that that's what we, that's the only practical thing we can do. So I don't take the pragmatic approach to practice. I look at practice as a process of dialectical development where we advance in our understanding, which in turn helps advance our practice. We have to understand that the capability of having a practical approach is determined by the, the quality of the theoretical framework that guides that approach. So if you have a contributionist approach, you're only gonna to lead to a minimalist kind of liberalism and reformism that will be easily wiped away because the ultra right play a very important role in this dynamic for us. What the ultra-right has done is to get people to think in terms of liberalism as revolutionary. And so what we do, we begin to distort our history. And so now things like the 1619 Project or the things like critical race theory are thought mm -hmm. to be revolutionary because the right has dubbed them as leftists. So if Trump calls Obama a leftist, and we know that Obama had nothing to say on behalf of black people. <laughs> then we get a scholar. What's this guy who wrote this book called When We Were in Power? Oh, uh, uh, Tennessee Coates. Yes. I mean, uh, no, that's uh, O'Neill. No, it's Coates. Come Coates, on. yeah, Coates. Yeah. You know yeah. Coates, right? Yeah. They paid him dearly for his compromising politics. Isn't he wealthy now? Didn't he get one of those genius awards yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Right, and when we were in from power. The <laughs> this is what, I, what I'm trying to say, Professor Hatton, is that we have to become resolute, especially as scholars and intellectuals, not to fall into the minimalist trap because the great majority of our people who are struggling for their lives need the assistance that we can provide because they have not been afforded the opportunity that we have been afforded. We're not smarter than the masses of people. We have just been fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. My parents are more brilliant than I will ever be. If I could be half the person my mother and father were, they would call me a genius. <laughs> they do. Yes. You see, because my parents were that. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that Accepting, accepting then the lowest grade of, you know, attachment to black intellectual thought. And that's what I look at 1619 as. Yeah. Remember, Du Bois wrote Souls of Black Folk in 1903. That's how many centuries ago. You see, we have to begin to say, what did he write when he went to Ghana? What was he trying to do? Why did he have to leave the United States? That's where we understand when Du Bois began to pull it all together and he became a danger to this country. But at one point, everybody was, you know, oh, yes, Dr. Du Bois, blah, 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 blah. but Du Bois grew. And fortunately, he lived 95 years. And the fact that he could live, live that long and grow is important. Dr. King didn't, never made it to 40. Uh, Malcolm X didn't make it to 40. Patrice Lumumba didn't make it to 40. And we can go on and on and on. But once we understand that a revolutionary solution is not a matter of utopianism, mm 
It's a matter of understanding the materialist interpretation of history and how that guides us along a process of stages of development where we ultimately get to where we want to go. Mm -hmm. So what I would do if I was in your situation, take the 1619 project and then critically study it with the brothers Absolutely. and point out the, the limits to the brothers. Thank you, Professor. Professor Hatton, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to give you a chance to respond, but I also want to make sure that our folks in the Q&A are getting a oh. chance to, to uh, have be heard. So let, let me just read one of the questions, and then Professor Hatton, if you want to respond to, to Dr. McClendon, that would be great. So I uh, just want to bring in this question from Jason, who says, can you talk more about the limits of wealth as a conduit for Black freedom and the, conduit, and the conflict between dialectic materialism and the bourgeois materials wealth solutions proposed in 1619 project. And I think Steve, you were talking about that a little bit earlier. And then, you know, Professor McClendon, I also heard you talk about reparations somewhere in there. So maybe we could return to that question in just a moment. But Professor Hatton, you want to respond to uh, Dr. McClendon? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think uh, I am, I'm taking notes and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm the choir with, when Dr. McClendon is speaking. Uh, I mean, again, it, it, and, and, and just to think of, I mean, also when uh, Dr. King is talking about his critique of gradualism, I also see that as part of the very, the ways in which you are, I mean, I'm making an excellent point that is one that, that is certainly always with me as I'm trying to negotiate these kinds of, uh, you know, spaces where I'm given a kind of opportunity, but the, the opportunity comes with conditions, right? And so, right. Then how does one do? And and, and so I th I appreciate the the both both the, the the references, but also right the you know right the 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 ways in which you've noted that this has been done and can continue to be done. So uh, no, very much uh, in agreement. And I I think um, on the souls of black folk, uh, m maybe we can return to that question uh, because right it is uh, right. I mean. For, for for Du Bois to be born, right, three years, I mean, 1868, right? So, I mean, this mm -hmm. is, right? and then to just before this March on Washington, right, in 1963, I mean, that's quite a remarkable span of a life in which to live. And as you point, right, out that uh, the, the, the ways in which he is, uh, his ideas have shifted over that time, and right, even his engagement with the United Nations and his disillusionment with the United Nations, and how that further, uh, right, makes him resolute in trying to in in, in in sharpening his own his vision, right, his uh, his 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 engagement with Shirley Graham Du Bois, and so so that the, I, I I take the point of that that way in which we have to look at the work that he is. is that is developed later in life. Mm. But there's something that I want to, to retain from the possibility of the souls of black folk. And maybe that that's something to, to address maybe later. But uh, I think um, perhaps to address the question of the, the audience. Yeah. Yes, th thank you. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, you wanna, you wanna take on that question about the uh, the materialist uh, wealth solutions. And there's another related question from, from Basil, Bas Basil Winters, who asks about ethical consumption, you know, focusing yeah. on black owned businesses and, and so right. on. What do you think, Dr. Ferguson? Um, let me take the second one uh, first. I, I think that's an important issue um, about, you used to call it buy back black. Um, Part of, in my estimation, is that that's being used as a kind of loop in to, to, to get people to buy into Black capitalism. There's nothing inherently wrong from supporting a Black doctor or, uh, you know, a Black dentist or anything of that nature. It's the, it's the, the additional move of supporting Black capitalism. Um, I, I was thinking as we were, as you guys were talking earlier, um, I remember one of the ways in which I developed a kind of, um, you know, early political consciousness was by going to black bookstores in the 1980s. And that played a similar role in my political development, not just because it was a black business, but because I developed a relationship with those people. And they also gave me free books of things that they thought I should read when mm -hmm. I didn't have the money. So 
is there's nothing inherently wrong with supporting black business in that case. What we're witnessing today is because of the overall crisis of capitalism and the hard shift right, aspirational capitalism has become a dominant ideology. I, ca I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people at the barbershop talking about how to invest or how to you know, participate with Fortran or all these other uh, Bitcoin, um, all of these other schemes in order to get rich. The fundamental issue, and I said it at the very beginning, and I hope I didn't sound uh, crazy or extreme, we <laughs> have to seriously address the question of, are we for capitalism or social? That's a fundamental question. If you ask Nicole Hannah-Smith, are you for capitalism or socialism, and tell her I need a yes or no answer, she's going to hedge and, and key haul and call you a class reductionist, and she's going to do all of that. But our people are suffering trying to survive every day. That's just a fundamental issue when you get out down to the court. It could be the prisons. It could be as a result of what, what we've seen in terms of COVID. Sure, our, the leaders of our country say, okay, we've turned the corner and turned into COVID. But we know the number of people that have gotten left behind, working class people, Black people, as a result of a, an economy that they collapse, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And so part of what we're seeing now is, and you can, you can take your pick, it could be Jay-Z, it could be Beyonce, Hannah Nicole Smith, but they're all espousing Black capitalism. What does Beyonce tell you? I want to be the next Black Bill Gates. What does Jay-Z, when you listen to Jay-Z, Jay-Z says, I want to be the Black Warren Buffett. Now, I, we joke about this all the time, but do you think there's a white person that says my leader is Jeff Bezos and therefore I want to be like Jeff Bezos, right? It, capitalism is capitalism. In order to be a capitalist, you have to exploit someone. It, it, there's no, it's, I don't know how to be more simple than that in, in terms of these discussions. Not to be, I'm not speaking down to people, but these are the core issues that we're getting, that are getting left behind because as is pointed out both, both by both panelists, we're chasing behind discussions that don't address our fundamental lives and the problems in that. Clearly the most recent example of that is, here we spent a whole week of talking about, should Will have sm uh, smacked Chris Rock? <laughs> <laughs> but for the average black person, that's an interesting discussion, but Am I going to have to work 50 hours this week? Am I going to have to worry about job security? Am I going to have childcare? Am I going to have to worry about whether or not the mayor of Chicago is going to cancel school because the Chicago teachers have gone on strike in the best interest of teachers and parents? And those are more fundamental contradictions that we have to engage with because remember, the mayor of Chicago is black. <laughs> she has mm -hmm. power. <laughs> she has more power than the teachers union collectively, which embodies all the teachers of the Chicago area. So these are the types of, I think, real important contradictions. And let me add one other thing to kind of go off the discussion we were having. One of the things that I've done at a personal level and I don't expect anything in return from it. Whenever I go to the barbershop, I always leave a few books behind for free. And, you know, with the hope that people pick it up and read it. But sometimes it's the little things that you do in terms of advancing political education that are important, where people may not be able to afford $35 to buy the 1619 Project. But if they see a free copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X, a shot of Shakur, that could be the opening for them to develop a political consciousness. Steve, Steve, there's a, a second question, and, I, and you addressed this briefly in your remarks. So I want to put this on the table and hear what the others have to say about this too, which was um, from an anonymous person. Can the speakers tie this discussion to questions of global class str struggle that transcend race? Mm -hmm. And you know. I, 
I mean, 16, 19, and, and Professor McClendon, you talked about this too. It's like, it's a story about this United States. Right. But what it, what what else do we need? Would we need like 16, 19 for the globe? <laughs> or what would that look like? And I mean, yeah. I'm just, can we globalize this conversation a little bit? Well, one thing we have to understand, who owned the ship that brought those 20 indentured as they refer to them, Negars, N-E-G-A-R, uh, to um, Virginia. Who owned the ship? Does anyone know? <laughs> you see where I'm going with that. It's an international, the, the slave trade, and that they weren't even slaves, they were indentured servants, but the slave trade was international in character. You can't forget the impact that the Haitian Revolution had on real conceptions about democracy and what it meant then for enslaved people to go from freeing themselves from slavery to taking state power. That's why C.L.R. James's book, Black Jacobin, still remains a classic work for people to read because in Haiti, African people in Haiti were able to of slavery and create their own country. And this is one reason why Haiti suffers today because U.S. imperialism, and here's where we begin to understand the relationship of capitalism and imperialism. As Lenin said, imperialism is the monopoly stage of capitalism. And what the United States has done, if we look very carefully in its historical development uh, via the Monroe Doctrine, has made it clear that in terms of its boundaries, they do not limit themselves to what is the territory of the United States, but they encompass the whole of this Western hemisphere through the Monroe Doctrine. And then more concretely, places like Puerto Rico still remain a colony of the United States. And due to UN resolutions around colonialism, they decided to rename it as a commonwealth as a legal maneuver to continue to exploit the Puerto Rican people. And we know as recent as Donald Trump throwing toilet paper at the people of Puerto Rico, remember that? That was atrocious. That was the most dehumanizing, demeaning actions of imperialism, but it was symbolic of the broader international dimension. So the person who raised that question has to understand that there is a material basis for white supremacy, racism, and national oppression. There are people who benefit from the deaths of millions of people. One of the sad parts of the discussion today around the Ukraine is that while a number of people are raising their hands, and I'm not saying they should not, they don't understand the Ukraine issue and a world context. They've been killing children in Yemen. In fact, more children have died in Yemen from the very kinds of things that have just happened in the Ukraine for a number of years. Yet you see no discussion in any of the major media. So why is it then that Yemen is not discussed and Ukraine is discussed? Why is it that African students who were studying in the Ukraine still have not been able to leave when they were trying to get out of Ukraine and have come forth and said, well, wait a minute, there's racism at the border. How do you address this? So what we have to understand that at an international level, we generally, I'm talking about we who are African-Americans in the United States are very backward. I'll be very frank about that. If we look at the Black Congressional Caucus and their positions on so many questions from Zionism to Palestinian liberation, on all the international questions, they're silent. In fact, most of them are pro-Zionists. They have already gotten money from big supporters who do not allow them to speak out on such issues. And so we have to be more conscious, I think, as scholars and intellectuals to bring the international dimension of capitalism as a world system and to focus for our everyday lives. What we have to do is to break down issues around political economy and imperialism so that the average person 
who's struggling every day can understand the contradictions between what's happening to people throughout the world, what's going on in places like Cuba, why Cuba was able to actually produce and had to produce their own vaccines for COVID, while the United States blocked sending any medicine whatsoever to Cuba. Well, why is Cuba being treated like this? Because Cuba did not bend over to the Monroe Doctrine, and Cuba decided to operate as a sovereign state. Well, why is that important? Isn't that the issue people are debating about the Ukraine? That the Ukraine should be a sovereign state and therefore make its own choice of whether it joins NATO? Ah, but the Russians say what? We can afford to have NATO on our border. Isn't that what the United States said about Cuba? We as African Americans have to begin to understand that these questions about imperialism are not limited to white supremacy, racism, but we have to be more attuned to the fact that when we have the inhumanity of imperialism exercising itself, we need to take a critical approach and a very critical approach to the United States government. Steve, do you want to add something to that? Or uh, Dr. Hatton, you guys want to take up that global question? No, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I th again, I think that, uh, you know, mic drop. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but certainly, I mean, yes, I mean, uh, uh, I can only, can only agree. And, uh, but, but, but of course, you know, the, the notion of transcending race, I think as uh, you know, Dr. McClendon has pointed out, I mean, he, he's pointing up to, to even within the global critique where race becomes an Central, central, right? I mean, again, your your European nations have been quite clear that the uh, the removal of you know uh, asylum applications or the you know the kind of measures that uh, you know uh, asylum seekers or refugees would have to normally go through if they were from Yemen or from racialized uh, spaces, and that have been eliminated for Ukrainian populations is because. They look like us. They have the, the, the European nations have been quite clear. That's that's why. I mean, this is happening to someone who looks like us, and therefore we will remove all application processes and we will open our arms. and And so, I think, right uh, as Dr. McClendon has pointed out, race is still central to to that global critique right? and struggle. There, there's a question. Um, it's from Lawrence, <clears throat> and he's asking about. Um, critical thinking and how that how that works. Um, and I think the second question is, is digs a little deeper. And so he says, do you feel like the process of deep learning that is making connections to develop relational maturity in life is now becoming a threat to the constitutional maturity of the United States? And I'm wondering, uh, you know, it'd be nice to hear Lawrence explain that a little bit further, but I'm wondering if the question is, um, you know, when we start digging into these questions, um, is, is this viewed as a threat? And who is it a threat to? And then what does one do to respond to that threat situation? And if you don't mind me just adding something from the standpoint of the moderator, you remember there was this 1776 project that was proposed by President Trump, mm -hmm. which was a response to 1619. And I think that may be part of that dynamic of threat and response. So um, just throw that to our, our panel here. I've always argued that when we think about critique, there's three ways we can begin with that question. <clears throat> Excuse me, empirical, which deals with matters of fact, conceptual, which deals with the ideas that we develop in interpreting the facts, and ideological, which deals with the worldview, which can be shaped by the facts and how we interpret the facts. So they're not disconnected, but differences of worldview are fundamental differences. So when you have a fundamental difference, you can never come to a consensus because the worldview is fundamentally different. So if you are um, Donald Trump and you say 1776 
verses 16, 19, it really didn't matter whether there was a 16, 19 program going on, a 16, 19 project going on. Donald Trump was already in 1776 in the <laughs> traditional sense, right? So when we talked about this guy who wrote the national anthem and why it is, is so ingrained in U.S. culture that even a sporting event requires people to ritually stand for the flag and not even understand that the guy who wrote that in the context that he wrote that was in the context of slavery. That's Francis Scott Key was a slaveholder, a lawyer who, who prosecuted abolitionists and the best friend of G uh, Chief Justice Taney who made the Dred Scott decision. They are on the same level of thinking. So how can I, as a Black person, follow that? Critical thinking would, to, to me would mean then, given the facts of the case, given the ideas and interpretation of the facts, my worldview would not allow me to do that. So even if everybody in the arena is standing up, I sit. Now, critical thinking is also involved in how we make an assessment. And what I talked about earlier in terms of a materialist historical interpretation, a dialectical philosophical critique. I would give you this example and I call it M-O-L-I. M stands for a movement. What is the character of the movement in which you're trying to make an assessment? So for example, if we're talking about 1619, what is the character of that movement? And we can talk about a, a bunch of influences, right? That come into play when we think about the 1619 project as a movement. Or what is Black Lives Matter as a movement? Now, when we move from movement, we have to move to the next level, which is organization. What organizational forms are in fact attached to that given movement? So that's why in my, <clears throat> excuse me, in my presentation, I wanted to point out, don't overlook the fact that New York Times is the organizational basis for the movement called the 1619 Project. Don't lose sight of that. See, because if you lose sight of that, you can fall for what the ultra right is saying, 1776 versus 1619, when in fact, that is, a, that is a false equivalence. What we have in fact is another form of the ruling idea, only in liberal form. What Dr. Ferguson was talking about when we look at the difference between a liberal and a conservative is not an alternative to the system. It's like they say, it's the wings. The left wing and the right wing or the liberal wing and the, and the conservative wing are the same wings and are the wings on the same bird. So we don't say we have an alternative, we're just looking at another part of the anatomy. So we go from the movement to organization. And then the critical thing next, L is leadership. So who is leading? with respect to that movement in organizations. And sometimes it's not a single individual, right? It's a multiplicity of individuals. Who is leading that? That's why a lot of people didn't understand Trump and they saw Trump as an individual, as a leader, when in fact, the organization which was tied to him, the Republican party had a substantial leadership that found in Trump the personification of their interests. It wasn't that Trump was an individual in and of himself. Trump was a, was a personification of another leadership group within the Republican Party. And the Republican Party had been moving successively, as Dr. Ferguson says, more and more to the right since the Reagan administration. So we have to understand that very clearly. So we look at then leadership. Then the last movement, organization, leadership, and then ideology. So we come back to that word ideology. And that's what we can say. What is the worldview that is framing this movement, this organization, the leadership of that organization, and then the ideology that they embrace? That's a very important way to think about critical thinking, because now what you're doing, you can start at any of those points, right? You may start with leadership, 
and then tie the leadership into the movement and organization. Or you might start with ideology, study the ideology and see how that's connected with movement, organization and leadership. Or you may start with the organization. You may study a given group, let's say the Republican party or the Democratic party or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or uh, SCLC, right? You say Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we get right away to the, to the very important letter written by Dr. King in Birmingham in 1963. And that letter, by the way, Dr. Haddon, I would say would be a very good one to give to the, the brothers at, you know, where you're teaching. Because in that letter, Dr. King does a profound philosophical analysis of why it is of immediate necessity to carry out the struggle and does not accept this notion of pragmatic pragmatism by saying, oh, well, it's not practical for us to do that. You have to move uh, gradually. In fact, we just studied the letter in both of my classes this semester. And we had a question on that in the midterm exam. And the question was, who is Dr. King writing to? Is he writing to white supremacists, true or false? And the students, the great majority of students understood he wasn't writing, he wasn't writing to the ultra-right, the white supremacists. He was writing to the so-called white allies who told him, don't go a step towards mass demonstrations, even if you have a philosophy based upon principles of nonviolence. And what did Dr. King respond to by saying? No, I can't go that way. We're not going to reduce our struggle to simply laws that repress black people. As a, as a Christian, he says, there's a higher moral principle, a moral law, which is the imperative. He had his own kind of uh, moral imperative. It wasn't Kantian in that sense, but yet he says, we are have an imperative to act. Now, when we look at critical thinking then, we can understand how that was more significant in my estimation, what he did in Birmingham in writing that letter than the speech he did in August of that same year that he made in August called I Have a Dream. But what mm -hmm. happens ideologically they manipulated so that all we know about King is I have a dream. And very few people know about the letter from Birmingham. Very few people know about the speech he made in February of 1968, two months before he was assassinated, when he talked about Dr. Du Bois. Dr. Du Bois was one of the founders of a journal called Freedom Ways. And Freedom Ways decided to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Dr. Du Bois, who was born, as you said, Dr. Hatton, in uh, 1868. So in February, he was born in February of, of, of 1968, Dr. King made a speech. And in that speech, uh, commemorating Dr. Du Bois, he says, we can no longer make a quagmire of the fact that Dr. Du Bois was a genius and a communist. He didn't leave out the communists. He didn't, he didn't tiptoe around the tulips. He spoke very candidly. And two months later, we see his assassination. So we have to understand then that when we begin to selectively and critically uh, uh, approach materials, and I know Lawrence is, an, excuse me, an outstanding graduate student. He's a student of mine who is going to be an outstanding educator and uh, administrator in public schools. That's what he's working on. He's finishing his doctorate. He's a brilliant, excuse me, young man. And so thank you for that question. As for the deeper question, the deeper learning issue, what I would say is that, yes, when you think in terms of ideology, that's when you're going deeper. You're questioning one's worldview. Many people will have a, a compromising attitude over matters of fact. So, oh, I just didn't know that. Okay, so it's a fact that the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, not only with the Emancipation Proclamation, because there were so many other 
African Americans still held in slavery in the border states. Okay, that fact I could agree with. Oh, I can agree agree with the concept then that real emancipation really didn't start with the 13th Amendment, but the 14th Amendment, because with the 14th Amendment, African Americans can be understood conceptually as citizens of the United States. But then when you take the broader worldview and you begin to say, well, look what the Republicans did with Reconstruction and why it was that 10 years later, they were trying to turn back the clock, that's when you're going to get a bunch of people say, oh, where now you're no longer a patriot. So from a worldview standpoint, we're back to uh, Trump, even though you may be a liberal, you're back to 1776. So that's where the deeper questions begin to arise when you question the worldview. As long as you don't question the worldview, and that's why I pointed out Dr. King, 1963, he didn't question the worldview. He embraced bourgeois liberalism, with I have a dream. He was embracing that. He talked about the ideals and trend. That's what uh, Myrdal wrote about in 1944, the conflict between creed and deed. That's all he was saying in 63, and everybody loves that speech. But look at the speech he made in February 1968. Freedom Ways published that piece, so you can go and read the speech of what he says about the voice and then ask the question, why was it that just two months after that, Dr. King was assassinated? Why was it when Dr. King came out against the war in Vietnam that all the major civil rights leaders who had embraced a liberal ideology as King espoused in 1963 denounced King, that he was left alone just like the boys had been left and Paul Robeson had been left a decade before. That, that's, a, that's a very important thing for us to look at. Dr. King, Roy Wilkins denounced him. Baird Rustin denounced him. A. Philip Randolph denounced him for his position on Vietnam. He stood alone among the major civil rights leaders because he took a stance that was in principle consistent with his philosophy of nonviolence before those liberal contributionist types that was unpatriotic to, to stand up and speak against Vietnam. You can read Bayard Rustin where he talks about uh, guns and bread and how he worked to deal with Lyndon Baines Johnson even though he was a lifetime pacifist. I don't know if you knew about Bear Rustin was a lifetime pacifist, but he decided to compromise his lifetime principles and supported Lyndon Baines Johnson in Vietnam. Dr. King grew just as Du Bois grew. And when he took his stand, that kind of critical thinking, that kind of critical action, I believe is what accelerated the process to his assassination. And so that's why, Lawrence, when you think about critical thinking, you have to understand that critical thinking is not thought in itself, but thought that guides practice. Dr. McClendon, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I just want to point out to you that in the chat, there's a number of people who are saying this is mind opening and mind altering, this, this discussion. And, um, and we need to hear more of this uh, and, and think deeper about these things. I am, no, however, also thing, paying uh, attention to our clock. <laughs> so thing, I, I, and I'm respectful uh, of, of folks' time, and especially those of you who are on East Coast time zone, you're, you've been with us through the dinner hour. And so I want, I want to urge us towards a conclusion. We got about five minutes left. And I just want to, I'd like to invite each of our panelists, if you could offer you know, a minute or two, just quick closing comments. Bearing in mind that we have students listening, like, you know, what, you know, what, what can students do? What, how should they be thinking next? So just a kind of quick summary of, from each of you. Dr. Hatton. Great. You know, I want, um, I want to follow on the, uh, the very important points that um, uh, Dr. McClendon laid out on critical thinking. And, and maybe one way to also think about this in the context of the 1619 Project and also uh, what has happened in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and protests around the world. And you know, one, one figure, and this sort of intersects with 
with um, Rustin and K Dr. King and one figure whose words have also been bandied about and, and, and circulated everywhere are Baldwin's, right? James Baldwin. And so um, uh, from his essays, right? I mean, the, which has already been kind of an indispens indispensable volume for many, there, there are many more who are starting to read his work. And, and um, in all of the, you know, the European countries, they've come out with new translations. You know, France finally started to publish his work and even if they should have been had it in French a long time ago. Uh, so Baldwin's poignant and incisive critique and ability to uh, be quite direct in his interrogation of whiteness, white supremacy and the like, everywhere, you see his essays being uh, cited, uh, you know, whether in social media or even scholars now starting to write about Baldwin more. And, and Baldwin, someone that we can keenly point out as someone who is part of a kind of critical, cr critical tradition and uh, has, you know, understands that uh, ultimately, right, um, you know, that every, all theories are suspect, um, you know, ideas need to be modified and that ultimately one has to find their own moral center. But a, but a long-standing contention uh, with Baldwin scholars, and I think, um, you, know, it, you know, Langston Hughes, uh, Henry Louis Gates, all of those who have, who, who've, who have pushed the narrative that Baldwin is a masterful essayist and indeed the greatest essayist, the American essayist of the 20th century. But what Baldwin told us himself is that essays are easy and that those who agree with his essays are in many ways engaging the, in the simplest, most uncritical practice ever. In other words, if he is writing against white supremacy and you agree, well, what's more obvious than that? He says that people like my essays because essays are easy. He says, what is more difficult is to be a person. And so what Baldwin is saying is that why he understands himself as a novelist is because, and I don't, you know, these, the issues that come up in his novels and the ways in which he is writing about black life. Think about, um, you know, the, the film of his, if Beale Street could talk, the depiction that, that, you know, or even his later novels just above my head, or even when he takes on, uh, you know, black nationalism, and tell me how long the train's been gone, uh, that, that the difficulty to find yourself and to think critically within a narrative of that kind versus the ease of being led through an essay that points out what are very obvious wrongs and then you agree, go home and feel good about yourself. Baldwin is saying that's too easy. So to all those scholars who are pushing and telling us that these essays are the most remarkable, even against Baldwin's own assertion that that is not my primary form. That is something I had to do because of what's happening in the world. And the critical thinking that is necessary comes when you are forced to take on the persona of these characters that he has in these novels, black people, black women, you know, black people in Harlem, black people in the inner city facing the world when you fail to want to do the critical work in which you have to think about that predicament, this is where Baldwin sees the, the failure. So if we think about the 1619 project and that liberal readership that uh, Dr. Ferguson and Dr. McClendon have so rightfully pointed out who are consuming this uh, because of the ease with which it can be consumed, then it brings me back to what Baldwin made in that distinction. It's easy to read my essays because I'm asking you not to be a racist. Nobody wants to be a racist, so you agree. But take, put yourself in those worlds, those black worlds that I have created in these narratives. And then think about the police brutality, the scene of police brutality that I have created in just above my head. Think about the predicament of the jailed Fani and the woman, his, what, right, Tish, who has to deal with a life while he's imprisoned that I have done in If Beale Street Could Talk. Think about the predicament 
of these characters in another country. Think about the religious life of Go Tell It on a Mountain. And then you think about yourself in relation to those protagonists. And let's see where you wind up as a critical thinker. So I'll end with that. Uh, that's the work that is the work of critical thinking. And if I am, as I do, find myself in complete agreement with Dr. Ferguson and Dr. McClendon in that critique of the 1619 Project, perhaps it's to say like Baldwin, essays are easy, but it's much more difficult to be a person. Very good. Oh, very good. I, uh, I would- and, uh, Andrew, let me just share with you, we got a few minutes. Okay. I'd like to repeat that the Martin Luther King Gunnar Myrtle Lecture will be presented by Dr. Quintor Taylor. The topic on Wednesday, May 20th, Searching for Critical Race Theory in the 1619 Project in the Digital Age via www.blackpass.org. That website is the Google of the Africana Experience, 7 million visitors per year. So tune in, you'll get a webinar, a link for May 20th, Wednesday. Andrew? Dave, you, you wanna add a, a, a party, party comment? Yeah, I was just gonna reiterate that I think one of the limitations of the 1619 Project is that it limits its analysis to just looking at uh, racism and race, and it doesn't include a critique of capitalism. I don't think any of us here have said that you should not investigate the African-American experience or take an interest in Black studies, uh, but it's the nature of that study that's important. What interpretive lens are you bringing to the table? As many of us know, there are tons of works that you could point to that do a better job than uh, what the 1619 Project uh, does. There's uh, Lerone Bennett's Before the Mayflower, um, if you want something that's widespread, multicultural, uh, Ronald Takaki's From a Different Shore. Uh, if you want something that's more left-oriented, Herbert Gutman's Social History Project provides a phenomenal introduction to American history. And if you want something that easily a high school student or anyone else could read, Richard Wright's 12 Million Black Voices does a phenomenal job. So there's tons of those opportunities that you could take to learn African-American history that don't require you to, uh, you know, to buy into the 1619 Project. And probably most of those books are actually cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, thank you. Uh, Dr. McClendon, you wanna give us your last thought? Yes. First, I wanna thank Dr. Simba uh, who has always been a sustaining force over a number of years because when he started with the first of the symposiums, there was not enough resources available. So we didn't meet, at, <coughs> excuse me, annually. We met, but what, every other year? Yes. Yeah. And he, is, he has been able to gather a number of people who have been consistent supporters such as you, Dr. Fiala, and I want to thank you uh, for not only moderating this, but supporting our event today. I also want to thank my co-panelists uh, because I think that the dynamic that we were able to develop today will provide for many, and I know a number of my students are in fact watching this, will provide them with the perspective that they don't get uh, from me alone, but now they can see there are other scholars who are dealing with these questions that center on critical thinking. And so I want to thank both of you uh, for joining me today. My concluding statement is this, a drop of information does not constitute a river of knowledge nor an ocean of wisdom. Thank you. Well said, well said. Thank you very much to our panelists. And again, just to reiterate to Dr. Simba and the Africana Studies program here at Fresno State, um, 
Uh, hopefully we can do this again. And people said this in the chat, let's continue the conversation. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to wish everyone, you know, bon voyage, have a great weekend. And a special yeah. shout of thanks to my assistant, Ebony, who's been in the background, Ebony yes, yes. Burgos, who's yeah. doing the work Thank for you. us here. Thank Thank you. You. So, yeah. With that, we'll sign off. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you again so much for this excellent symposium.